Here we are at the last chapter of the section. This is chapter 15. And as I've said before, this is a highly abbreviated version of the chapter because I will be talking about protists later in the semester and I'm skipping over some of the elements of how life evolved. Now, most folks probably don't have to be told why microorganisms matter, right? That we're becoming more and more aware of the fact that these things are all around us and on us and even in us. Um, if the lower right, the lower left hand side of the diagram, you see a woman eating sushi and people think, oh yeah, sushi, the seaweed's wrapped around that. And that's true. And seaweed is a type of protist and that's why the picture is there. Again, we'll, we'll go into protists more later in the semester. Um, but there are also protists involved with the ice cream that the person is eating in the upper part of the slide. We'll get back to all this later. But um, including that strange looking steaming thing that looks almost like a hot tub at the bottom. So, getting started, your body is made of cells, right? All living things are made of cells. Your body contains trillions of individual cells. The, I always tell people, you're outnumbered. Yes, there are the cells of your own, you know, your own body, but there's microorganisms living in your body, right? In your gut and other areas. There's microorganisms living on the outside of your body. Uh, we find them on the skin, the mouth, the nasal passages, the various tracts that exit to the outside world. And if you were able to collect them all and put them all in one container, they'd weigh between two and five pounds. So it is actually not just significant in sheer numbers, but also in actual mass of your body. Now, we're coming more and more to understand the whole business of our microbiota. You can now go into the grocery store and you see yogurts advertised as probiotic and all this stuff, which is great. Except sometimes it's a little confounding because they say, okay, here's fiber that's good for your for your gut critters, but then they throw in sugar, which is not good for your gut critters. So sort of a mixed bag on that one. Anyway, uh, scientists hypothesize that disrupting these microbial communities, right? So think of these as ecosystems that are on and in your body. So just as disrupting an ecosystem in a forest or an ocean could be problematic, same thing for disrupting our own microbial communities. It's found that some of these organisms are involved with our immune system, right? So disrupting these guardians of your, of your body can increase your susceptibility to an infectious disease, even predispose us to certain cancers, and are now found to be involved in conditions such as asthma and other allergies, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, which is another uh, problem with the gut, and some forms of autism. There's a lot still to be studied there. Uh, so don't say, oh, you know, it's all because of microbes. No, it's just some elements of, of autism seem to be associated with microbial imbalance. And here's a colorized version of some of the wee beasties that share us. I always like to think of it in terms of, you're never alone. There's always a few billion, you know, individual organisms traveling the world with you. So I want to go briefly through this major episodes in the history of life part. The reason being is that I like this visual because it's very easy to say, oh, billions and millions of years ago. But the fact that they've found a way of mapping this onto the United States actually gives you kind of a way to, to mentally realize just how long life has been on earth and just how short life like us has been on this earth. Now the planet itself was formed about 4.6 billion years ago. The first cellular life, prokaryotes, these are cells without a true nucleus, they evolved by about three and a half billion years ago. Up to that point, the earth was just too hostile, it was too hot, it was too, just not a place where, where life could form or survive. So the first fossil evidence we have for prokaryotes, we've, we've tracked back to about three and a half billion years ago. About a billion years later, all right, so now we're seeing the numbers getting smaller because you're getting closer to the modern era. So at about 2.7 billion years, we start seeing oxygen production. The earliest Earth was actually a low oxygen environment. Oxygen was actually dangerous and toxic to the earliest prokaryotes. And even today, there are, there are prokaryotes that are still living in the world today to whom oxygen is, is actually a, a toxin, is actually dangerous. But we see evidence by 
things like soil, soil composition, that oxygen production started increasing enough to be building in the atmosphere and therefore be interacting with materials in the soil, like uh, think like rust, right? You know, iron will rust oxidize, you know, that form of rust. They could see chemical evidence of an increasing amount of oxygen in the air, along with other cool things like sampling deep ice and all that. Anyway, the prokaryotes began producing enough oxygen to be noticeable about 2.7 billion years ago. So photosynthesis by autotrophic prokaryotes had developed. Now prokaryotes had the joint to themselves. They had the planet to their, their themselves for about 1.7 billion years, right? So they showed up three and a half billion years ago. And till uh, that would be what, 2.2 billion years ago, they were the only living things. And so keep in mind that this is a prokaryotic planet for a very, very long time. And of course, they're still in great abundance today. Now again, here's that overview of the history of life that mapped onto the United States. So if you start to the way to the left side, so sort of slip over the, the corner in, into Canada there, you can see the little sign says zero miles. All right, so you're gonna be traveling from west to east. And as you go along this little red line, it's showing you along the way the various you know major events in the evolution of life. So let's go through this in a little closer view. All right, so picture the origin of the Earth about, now it says 4,600 million years ago. That's what the MYA is. That's the same thing as 4.6 billion years ago, right? So it's the same dates. It's just, you know, looking at in ter terms of million years ago on this, on this graphic, as opposed to saying billions of years ago. So where the, the dot would be, the period would be in, in 4.6 billion, just put a comma, right? And then it's you know, showing you the, the number of millions of years ago. So it's about 100 miles is about 100 million years. So starting up in, in Kamloops, you drive, you, you cross the border and you head down and, and pass through Seattle. And by the time you're getting to the top of California there, you'll see, oh, the oldest known rocks, right? So the oldest known rocks you've been able to, to aid, you know, determine the age of. Okay, that took a good chunk of time, right? So just the Earth solidifying, right? So instead of just being this molten mass of, of, of active material, almost like lava type like materials, you got enough cooling for rocks to start forming, right? So it took, you know, what, about a billion years for that to happen. Well, as things cooled and became more, you know, more stable, the first organic molecules formed, and the first evidence we have of life contained within cells is the prokaryotes forming at about three and a half billion years ago, or 3,500 million years ago. So now we're well into California. Let me go to the next slide. All right, so 1,100 miles. That's where we first see signs of cellular life in the fossil record. So as we travel along the way, we pass through San Diego, through Phoenix in Arizona, and right about Phoenix, so about 1,900 miles into your trip, <clears throat> we start seeing an increase of oxygen in the environment. And so now we're at about you know, 2,700 million years ago. We pass through uh, Arizona, New Mexico, crossing over Texas, and right when we get to Oklahoma City, so you're now 2,800 miles into your trip, we see the first fossil evidence of eukaryotes 1.8 billion or 1,800 million years ago. Moving further east, okay, so we're passing up, you see, as we pass St. Louis and on the way to Terre Haute, you start seeing the first multicellular fossils, right? So the first cellular life was, was prokaryotic Right, we see the first eukaryotes showing up about uh, 1.8 billion years ago. The first multicellular eukaryotic fossils we find at about 1.2 billion years ago. Okay, passing up to these, now we're getting into New York, so we're getting you know, geographically closer to where we are now. And right about the time we get to Erie, you see large complex multicellular organisms. So now we're less than a billion years ago. Now we're down to, it would be 0.6 billion years ago or 600 million years ago.
So this is the, the first large complicated forms, and they're still in the ocean. The first life evidence of life on land would be you know skipping across a little bit further into New York into Buffalo. So a hundred million years after we see the first evidence of big complicated multicellular guys, we see the first things moving onto land. These would be plants and fungi. As we cross New York State and we get to Albany over here on the, the east side, what they're depicting there at 108, I'm sorry, 180 million years ago would be things like the mid Mesozoic. When you think Jurassic Park and you think the big dinosaurs and the earliest flowering plants and all that stuff, okay, that's roughly what they're, they're depicting there. And that's, again, you know, less than 200 million years ago. So we get out of New York, we hit Massachusetts, and we go all the way to the, to the shore to Boston. Okay, now we're at 4,600 miles. Where humans show up is 0 0.195 million years ago. So the last stop was 180 million years ago. Now we're at less than 1 million years ago. Right, almost 0.2, two tenths of a million year, millions of years ago. So we showed up on the scene, you know, basically on the outskirts of Boston. If you go back to this slide, okay, you realize that we've only been around since, say, the the suburbs of Boston, whereas the, we see the the long track of the of the rest of the the history of life on on Earth. So just a neat graphic. As I said in the, in the review notes, you don't have to go memorizing all these. I just want you to have an idea that, yeah, prokaryotes have been here the longest, and then eukaryotes, relatively recently, multicellular eukaryotes, much more recently, and getting into stuff like, like ourselves, that's just really recent um, in terms of the history of life on this planet. Now, eukaryotes, we've mentioned this before. So as I said before, this is chapter 15 when the authors wrote this book, this would have normally been much later in the, in the, the this, this semester. So this is mostly repetitive. This is mostly stuff I already did in chapter four. So keep in mind when you see this, a lot of the, the points in the rest of this section are going to be things I've already mentioned. So eukaryotes, U for true, right? Things with a true nucleus, that K-A-R-Y part of the word means nucleus. So eukaryote is a, a living thing that has one or more cells, containing nuclei and other, because the nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle, nuclei and other membrane-bound organelles that you do not see in prokaryotic cells. Now, these evolved from prokaryotic cells. Uh, what we believe happened is, is larger prokaryotic cells became the home for smaller prokaryotes, and their descendants are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts that I mentioned earlier on. So mitochondria, the little things that break down food for ATP, are descendants of small prokaryotes. The chlor chloroplasts are, are descendants of small autotrophic, photosynthetic plants and, and algae. Now multicellular eukaryotes, eukaryotes that are more than one, you know, cells making an individual, we saw those about 1.2 billion years ago. So life on Earth was prokaryotic for the most part, then you got eukaryotic, but as far as multicellular stuff, that was relatively recent. Now, there's a period of time you sometimes hear about called the Cambrian explosion. And that sounds like it was a cat, you know, a catastrophic event. It is an explosion in that, in that sense. What they mean by explosion is going from relatively few shapes of living things to all these different, what they call body plants, all these different shapes. So think of a worm versus an insect versus a fish, right? These are all different shapes of, of, of animals. Well, at that point, about half a billion years ago, 541 million years ago, that's when the evolution of all the major animal body plants, all the major animal body forms, and all the major groups of classification that we know today, including some that have become extinct since then, that's when they all showed up. So we went from relatively few forms to suddenly, boom, huge diversity of forms. Uh, a little uh, geologically, a little while after that, 41 million years later, we start seeing evidence of plants, fungi, and insects starting to colonize the land. At the end of the Mesozoic, now we're at 65 million years ago, so when you, you think of the time when you, you know, when you see tyrannosaurs and uh, 
well-developed flowering plants. And you hear, you know, you think in terms of like, yeah, you know, the meteor striking and driving the, the dinosaurs into extinction. That's the end of the Mesozoic. The dominant part of the landscape goes from being things like swamps with ferns and, and stuff like that to something more like we see today, flowering plants, birds, mammals, including the, the earliest predecessors to primates, right? These are now occupying the landscape. Once the dinosaurs were wiped out, the things that survived now had the place to themselves, right? And that's when mammals had the great radiation. Mammals, you know, developed all the diversity that, you know, that they went into. So when we get to ourselves, we like to think about ourselves, we get to the origin of modern humans. That was about, you know, 200,000 years ago. So not a very long time. Now, I'm just putting one or two slides here. So again, we're not getting into the stages of the development of, of organic molecules. I just wanted to sort of point out that for the first several hundred million years of its existence, it was just too harsh for anything to have survived on this planet. Uh, it was, go back to four billion years ago, it was violent. Uh, but once it started cooling enough, water vapor condensed and fell as rain forming oceans. So, so water just being in a vapor, once things cooled off, water could then condense into, into the liquid form and it collected in oceans on this now cooling surface. But you still had vents in the, in the, the, the earth and things like volcanic eruptions still going on, right? You see in a volcano where things like lava and, and smoke come up. But in those eruptions were also gases like carbon dioxide, like methane, like ammonia. And all this stuff was being sent in, into the atmosphere. So it was this combination of, of conditions of the, you know, the collection of water and, and you know, the, these molecules being cast from the center of the earth out into the atmosphere. This is all sort of the stuff going into the great pressure cooker that became the development of life. We're skipping over all that though. Okay, so I, we're just sort of fast forward over to, um, again, the thing of the origin of life. The only reason I left this slide here is this harkens back to chapter one. Remember I talked about emergent properties? Okay, the fact that an emergent property is describing something that's more than just the pile of parts, right? So life is an emergent property that arises from the specific arrangement and interactions of the molecules in, the, in, that, in those living things. So this would be a good, good example of interactions within systems. So to understand that whole business of how life originated from non-living stuff, people have to really dig into chemistry, geology, physics, none of which we're doing in this course, right? So now I'm just going to skip over to talking about prokaryotes. And they're everywhere, right? Again, they lived and had the place to themselves for about two billion years. Any place there's life on this planet, there are prokaryotes, right? So they are still everywhere. If you were able to collect all the prokaryotes and weigh this biomass, this pile of, of living, you know, cellular material. If you weighed, you know, if you made two big piles, one of all the prokaryotes, one of all the eukaryotes, collectively, the prokaryotes would be 10 times more stuff, right? More living material than of all the eukaryotes. So they may be small, but there's a lot of them. We also find them in places where eukaryotes will just tap out, places that are too cold too hot, too salty, too acidic, or too alkaline, right? The two extremes of pH. So there's elements of, of the extreme parts of this planet. They probably evolved during the extreme early parts, you know, early history of the earth. And some are still around today. So there are places where they're still hanging out where eukaryotes just never, never wound up making it to. And of course we associate prokaryotes with diseases, right? So we see them involved with about half of human diseases. And some people you know, want to figure out what life was like early in, in the, the Earth's history. And what you're seeing in the picture here is, is a deep sea vent. This is so deep in the ocean that there is no sunlight. You see that the blackness surrounding the, the rest of the things in this picture. There is no life and light hitting the bottom of the ocean. So this is looking at example of things where photosynthesis really is not the main way of, of, of generating energy for living things. And so there's a lot of people studying, like, how does this work? We, we always think of all life as, as being powered by the sun. This is the, the exception. I've said there's, you know, with a few exceptions, this would be it. So 
it's just some neat stuff. We don't really get to get into it in this course, but um, but it'll pop up you know here and there when I talk about exceptions to the usual ways we, we look at life. So prokaryotes are not just the things that make us sick and the things that you know make our food go bad and all that. They are again part of our microbiota, micro for tiny biota, living living collection. These are the, the community of microorganisms that live on and in our bodies. And they do things for us, like supply essential vitamins. There are vitamins we don't eat, we don't make ourselves, but these guys create it, and we can take advantage of that. They allow us to extract nutrition from food molecules that we wouldn't otherwise be able to digest. They have enzymes that we don't have. Uh, they also do things like break down dead skin cells. And again, we're learning that they're, they may be involved with keeping disease-causing intruders from getting, you know, taking hold on our bodies. So they don't just live on us, they also help defend us. And if you look in the world around us, we see them involved in decomposing dead organisms and other waste stuff. Uh, they're returning elements to the environment. Remember I said way back when that energy flows and nutrients cycle. Well, these are a critical element of cycling nutrients from things that have died or waste materials like you know, feces, etc., and returning those elements to the environment to be used again. And we always have to keep in mind, these guys are small. You're seeing the, the tip of a pin magnified about 650, uh, 605 times. And so all those tiny little orangey spots you see on there, are, it's colorized. They don't actually look orange in real life, but it's a colorized image. And you can see all those bacteria. It looks like it's, you know, they're on a great big crag of a mountain or something. It's not. It's the very tip of a pin. Now, this stuff we've done already, prokaryotic cells, they have genetic material, but it's not enclosed in a, in a membrane that we'd call a nucleus. They don't have other membrane enclosed organelles. They typically have cell walls exterior to their plasma membranes. And as I'll get into more detail briefly, they display a huge range of diversity. So again, this is something we've already done in, in, in the class, right? We're comparing the components of prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells. So I'm not really gonna talk all the way through this, but again, this is just sort of a comparison of features you see in one and the other. And again, some things they both have like ribosomes, but they're not exactly the same. That's why you can make antibiotics that attack prokaryotic ribosomes to kill bacteria, but they won't harm your own cells because the ribosomes are a little different in structure. Now, the three forms, we've already covered this in the lab, right? So spherical, some say co cocci, some people could say cocci, cocci. There's a bunch of ways of pronouncing it. When you see C-O-C-C-I, that means around prokaryotic shape. Singular would be coccus or, or coccus, one single cell. So often you'll see U.S. as a singular in Latin-based words, and you'll see I as the plural form. So similarly, you got the rod-shaped cells, the ones that look like little, little, almost like rectangles, and those are bacilli. So one would be a bacillus, plural would be bacilli. And then, of course, the spiral or curved ones uh, which used to be commonly called in these books spirilli, but now it, it seems like they're dropping that to just look for terms like a spiral or an example being a, something like a spiro cheat, right? So look for that spiro, meaning spiral. And almost all of them are unicellular. There are some species that will exist in groups of a couple of cells, uh, but for the most part, they're, they're single cell organisms. About half of them are mobile, they, they move around, and all the ones that travel have flagelli. So again, here's those common shapes we met back in the lab. So again, pretty easy once you see it at this level of magnification, right? You see spheres, rods, and then those little curlies, which are the spirilli. Now there are some odd exceptions. There are some bacteria that are relatively huge. Um, if you look at the lower right-hand side, you see that that's a light microscope, right? So not an SEM like you see in some of these other things. That's a light microscope, 125x, right? So that's a 10x ocular and, you know, a, a, a 12.5x um, objective, right? That's a regular mic light microscope, and that's pretty darn huge. So there are some weird, you know, outliers here and there. Uh, the cyanobacteria in the lower left, you see cells of somewhat different shapes in a chain. Um, 
Dactinomycetes above is another example of, some, of a type of bacteria that are found in groups, but they're not like a multicellular thing like we are, where you have all these different types of cells that are interdependent on each other. So multiple cells, but not the same as a multicellular organism. Now, one way in which we encounter prokaryotic forms is if you think about it, if you're like teeny little cells, part of your concerns in life is to just attach to where you're living. So what often happens is prokaryotes will live in, in colonies. They'll live, they're, each one is still an individual, but they'll live in a big group. And they actually create and share this, this sticky material. So collectively, the prokaryotes and the, the gluey material that they, they secrete and live in is called a biofilm. And we find them everywhere, right? Rocks, organic materials, including living tissue. Uh, metal, plastic, right? These guys, you know, if they can land on it, hold on to it, and, and be able to carry out their life functions, they'll stick to it. One that we're pretty familiar with is dental plaque, right? This, these are bacteria that form this, this gluey material and are sticking to your teeth, right? You know, you always hear about people, you know, how do you get rid of dental plaque? Because it's not just that you have these little guys living on you, but during their, their metabolism, they do things like create acids, acids that can degrade the enamel on your teeth, right? So this is involved with tooth decay. If you've ever had a pet dog or a pet cat and they have a water bowl, you've tried to clean that water bowl and it has that sort of slick feeling on the inside, that would be an example of a biofilm. So these are this, this is stuff that's tenacious. And we also see biofilms and bacteria that cause some diseases in humans. So you know, between brushing your teeth or cleaning out a water dish for a cat or a dog, you've encountered biofilms um, at times. And here's a nice colorized image of dental plaque, right? So this is a biofilm that forms on, on your teeth. So you can see that there's different types of prokaryotes there. And you, what you don't see so much in the illustration is the sort of gluey material that holds them all together and makes it hard for them to be washed off or scraped off of where they're living. Uh, in case you ever wondered about your household sponge, uh, household sponges are things that should be cleaned or, or, you know, put in a microwave or just replaced pretty routinely. That's why, you know, silicone is kind of a nice replacement for your standard old cellulose sponges because you can boil, you know, a, a, a scrubby made out of silicone. Because if you don't, all these things have been colorized, the red, green, yellow, and blue dots on there, those are all bacteria. So... It's the sort of thing that can potentially contaminate your food supply if you use a, a relatively dirty sponge. Now, how do you get more prokaryotes? Binary fission, right? They're not laying eggs or doing anything like that. Simply a cell will grow to a certain point and they get into that in your uh, surface to volume ratio videos for the lab. They grow to a certain point and then they simply divvy up everything to, you know, to both sides. So they copy the genetic material. So each half gets a, you know, gets a copy. They divide up the, the other cell contents and then it simply pinches in half. And prokaryotes can do this really fast if conditions are favorable, right? It's something called exponential growth. Usually we think of things in linear terms. One plus one is two, plus one is three, plus one is four. But this is something where it goes from one to two to four to eight. You know, it, you see something like a rapid increase. Unfortunately, we got to see this watching the, the beginning of the COVID virus, right? Where you, all of a sudden you went from relatively few cases and suddenly there was this massive increase. And this is the sort of thing that happens. It's organisms that can, that can reproduce expen exponentially uh, can grow in numbers really fast. Now, most prokaryotic populations can't sustain that for long because if you're growing and dividing and growing and dividing, you're all using resources. You're all generating waste, right? So you're going to be using up nutrients. You're going to be building up waste. So few prokaryotic populations can do that for long. So it sort of takes off and then it plateaus and reaches a, a stable, steady state. So environments usually are limiting. So yeah, they can, they can reproduce quickly, but the environment basically will, will slow them down. Right, metabolic waste products will pollute the environment, they'll run out of nutrients, things like that. Now, some prokaryotes, when things do get tough, can survive by forming endospores. 
so in essence, it's like a little a little protective armor. Endo means inside. Spore means refers to something that often like a spreading element. Like spores are one way that fungi distribute their individuals. So this is something where you have a little you know a little prokaryotic cell contained in a package. So you have this thick coated protective cell produced within the prokaryotic cell that can survive drying out, survive trauma, survive extreme temperatures. This is why when, when you, uh, if you've ever, if you've ever uh, put food in cans or, or, or glass jars to, to save it for later, one of the things you have to do is sterilize everything. Why? Well, because if you trap some little organisms in there and you didn't use enough pressure, uh, temperature and pressure to, to actually kill everything, those little guys can sit there and wait for conditions to be right, and then they'll start growing again. This is why if you ever see the uh, aseptic packaged food, right, the sort of boil-in bag type things, you can leave it on the shelf and just grab it whenever you're ready to eat it. And they always say if, it, if it's inflated looking, right, if it, if, it, if it looks like it's bulging, like a can is bulging, you don't eat these. Why? The bulging is because the microorganisms have started metabolizing and they're doing things like producing waste gases, which are eventually going to be strong enough to actually deform a can or, or expand the, the little pouch that the food is in. And many of these microbes generate toxins. So it's not just that somebody, you know, these guys got to the food before you did. Part of what they're, you know, either they're the cell themselves or it's things that they secrete can be very dangerous uh, to, our, to our, our, our own health. So you have to make sure to sterilize food if you're going to be you know, putting it up for, for use later. And you know, if you're looking at packages of food in the store, if it looks bulgy or inflated, you walk away. <laughs> All right, so prokaryotic pathways to transform energy and matter are more diverse than you see in eukaryotes like us. Right, I, I, I'll be talking about, in the next chapters, I'll be talking about um, one whole chapter. Chapter six will be respiration. Another whole chapter seven will be photosynthesis, right? So this whole thing of how cells turn organic molecules into ATP, into usable energy, or how photosynthetic organisms trap sunlight and convert that into the potential energy called chemical energy. Prokaryotics. These guys have been around a long time. They figured out other, they, they had to learn other ways to, to pull off being alive before the earth was all full of oxygen and all this. So we see some really wild stuff out there. Some species, instead of harvesting energy by trapping sunlight or digesting you know, food molecules like, like we do, they can harvest energy from inorganic things, right? Usually, usually if you're consuming energy, you're doing it in an organic form, right? You're eating food. These are this is all organic molecules, right? Lipids, carbohydrates, etc. These guys can break down inorganic stuff, such as ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. So, these are things that, that you don't, you won't be seeing a, a eukaryotic organism using. But these guys, they're old school. They're really old school, and they, these are pathways that developed probably billions of years ago. Uh, now, the fact that some of them have different metabolic pathways, make them excellent symbiotic partners with animal, plants, and fungi. Symbiotic means sim with biotic living. So one example, you see cows, cows eating grass. Cows don't have an enzyme called cellulase. So a cow can't digest cellulose, right? That's the fiber in cell walls of plants. But they have prokaryotes living inside them that do create cellulase. And so the cow has these things living in its stomach. So it chews up the grass, sends it down there. These little guys, you know, so the cow is digesting some parts of the grass, but as far as all the cell walls, they need those little microbes to do it for them. So the microbes, they have a pretty good gig, right? They have a place to live. They get a steady stream of food coming to them. Temperature is nice and consistent. And in return, the cow is getting uh, things like volatile fatty acids. It's getting, it's getting uh, nutrient energy molecules that it would never have otherwise been able to use. Usually you think of cellulose as roughage, right? It's fiber. It's just going to go through us, not changing much from the way it went in. If you have these microbes, then you can break down some of this stuff. So, yeah, we typically think in terms of 
phototroph, autotroph, right? Photo, uh, uh, pho I mean, sorry, autotroph would be something that's photosynthetic, right? Making stuff with light. The, there's another term, which is autotroph. Now, whenever you hear me saying autotroph through 99% oh, of the semester, what I'm actually saying is photo autotroph. It's making its own food, auto self troph feeding, but it's doing it by trapping sunlight. But because pretty much all the autotrophs we run into are photo autotrophs, you'll hear me just abbreviate it to autotroph. But if we go back to that last slide, there's also chemo autotrophs, right? The, the things that, that harvest energy from inorganic stuff, they're making their own food by breaking down inorganic things. So they're autotrophs, but instead of trapping sunlight, they're harvesting it from energy. So they're chemo autotrophs, as opposed to things like plants, which are photo autotrophs. So again, this is pretty much the only time you'll hear me talk about these other versions. Most of the time you'll hear me say autotroph, heterotroph. And I, because it's all eukaryotes, I'm abbreviating photo autotroph to just autotroph. There's also, if you look at something like us, right, we say, you know, we're heterotrophs, right? We, we, get, we get our food energy from eating other stuff, right? Hetero, other. We get our food by eating other things. But again, there's, there's variations on how prokaryotes do some consuming. I'm going to sort of step away from it there because we don't really get into it much further in this course. Just keep in mind that these guys have ways to, to, to pull off being alive that you never see in eukaryotes. So kind of cool stuff. Uh, again, the, the book, this version of the books are token away, so I'm not going to get any further into that and add more stuff to the pile that you have to learn. Back to symbiosis. Right. Symbiosis, literally living together, is a close association between organisms of two or more species. And these relationships take a whole bunch of, of, of possibilities. You have some situations where both organisms benefit, some where one benefits and the other is harmed, some where one benefits and the other doesn't know, even know the other guy is there. Right? So if you, if you have a mosquito feeding on your blood, right, that's a parasite. That's a type of symbiosis. If you see a lion, you know, kill and eat a gazelle, that's predation. That's another type of symbiosis where clearly one benefits and the other does not. So there's a whole bunch of types of symbiosis. Keep that in mind. So when I use that term, usually I'll get into further details to what type of symbiosis we're talking about. So back to that hydrothermal vent. Remember I showed you that deep sea vent with what looked like smoke coming up out of the out of the, the little vent in the bottom of the ocean. Well, there's these things called tube worms that you're going to see in the next slide. Now again, no sunlight. So, if there's no sunlight, you got no photoautotrophs. But you do have the chemoautotrophs, the ones that can take inorganic stuff and make food energy from that. Well, these tube worms have bacteria living inside them that do this. So just like the cow has the bacteria to break down cellulose, these guys have sulfur bacteria to break down stuff like hydrogen sulfide to make food energy. So the, the animals absorb the sulfur compounds in the water, bacteria turn them into, you know, use them as an energy force, energy source to convert carbon dioxide from seawater into organic molecules. So just like a plant does this using light energy, these guys are doing it with chemical energy. And in turn, the host has, you know, is provided with food. So again, they provide a place to live, they provide a steady stream of, of nutrients, and in return, they get fed as well. So here's one of those, those giant tube worms. And these things are feet long, and they're huge, huge things. But it's kind of awesome that we have these, these ecosystems that are not based on light. So we used to think of, of living things as based on light, so kind of neat. So in addition to photosynthesis, many cyanobacteria, cyano, it refers to blue-green. So many cyanobacteria, otherwise known as blue-green bacteria, are also capable of nitrogen fixation. This is a process of taking atmospheric nitrogen, nitrogen gas that's in the air, and converting it into a form that a plant can use. So plants need nitrogen. It's an important nutrient. 
but they can't just pull it out of the air. But there's these, these bacteria that can take nitrogen out of the air and build it into molecules that the plant can use. So nitrogen fixation is a critical part of the of living systems, you know, which involve plants because they need the nitrogen. And of course we need the nitrogen. We get that from eating the plants or eating the things that ate plants. Um, and we need these bacteria because they'll take the nitrogen out of the air and enter it into the, into the, you know, the living things that will be using it. So symbiosis with cyanobacteria give plants like a little water for an azola an advantage in nitrogen poor environments. Also, uh, you'll notice that there, it says water for an azola and it's in uh, italics and it's capitalized. That's a, that's a, a, means it's a formal scientific name. So azola is the formal name for this little water fern. So these guys get an advantage where other living things would be, you know, struggling to get enough nitrogen. These guys have their in-house fixation team that's doing it for them. So again, the cyanobacteria get a place to live and nutrients that they need. In return, that plant gets the nitrogen it would not be able to get from, say, the soil. And it's kind of cool because this is actually used in um, human agriculture. You see these little guys in rice production. So where the rice might have otherwise totally exhausted the soil uh, that, they're, that they're growing in, these guys are floating in the, in the rice paddocks and they're helping supplement the nitrogen. So humans have actually had a symbiotic relationship with these symbiotic organisms for a very long time. And in case you've never seen it, that little guy in the upper left is a zola. It's a little tiny water fern. And if you look at the second picture, you can see all those little guys floating on the surface of the water in a rice paddy. Now, because of their nutritional diversity, these guys actually do a lot of stuff that make our life easier or even possible. As I said before, life depends on recycling chemical elements, right? Elements cycle, energy flows. Well, you have all the stuff bound up in living things. When those things die, you, you know, other, if, if things, they weren't broken down, they would just all pile up. So because you have things like bacteria, or prokaryotes, and fungi, which are eukaryotes, eating all this dead stuff, they're using some of the nutrients and returning the rest to the soil. So life depends on recycling these chemical elements between the biological, right, the, the, say something like a dead animal or, or dead plant, and the physical components of ecosystems, right, returning them to the soil so that it can be taken up again. So this is an important series of interactions between biological systems. So prokaryotes are really important in these chemical cycles. So don't think of bacteria and other prokaryotes as just being bad things. They're critical for us to even remain alive. Because oh, otherwise, think about that. All, you know, all the stuff that would pile up if, if dead organisms and <clears throat> things like poop, etc., you know, just piled up and were broken down. So we can actually use living things to clean water, clean air, or even clean soil. All right, so this term is bioremediation, right? Improving things using living things. And one example is using prokaryotic decomposers to treat our sewage. Uh, it used to be going way back, people would just serve, ah, dump it in the river, or dump it in the ocean. And you know, once we start getting into large numbers of people, that really was not a good idea. So we've developed ways to take water that is contaminated by you know, feces, urine, etc., and clean it, right? Make it usable again, or at least make it so that we can put it back in the environment without it you know, being dangerous to the things living there. So we use prokaryotic decomposers to treat sewage. Uh, we also use it to clean up toxic chemicals. Uh, there's a picture a couple of slides in of an airplane spraying chemical dispersants on, you might recall the, the deep water, wow, that was 10 years ago now, uh, the, the deep water horizon spill down in the Gulf of Mexico. There's this horrible oil spill. Well, there are some microbes that eat petroleum type molecules. So they were doing is they're spraying compounds to break down the, the oil droplets and also containing bacteria to try and get them to, to hopefully digest at least some of it. And next page, this is an example of, of a sewage treatment facility. Uh, I, I run a lab at a sewage treatment facility. It doesn't, it doesn't run quite the way you see in this picture, but it, it's a similar way in which 
you take the liquid waste and you create an environment in which the microbes can literally eat all those, you know, these complex molecules that were in, you know, the food waste and the body waste and all that. And in essence, clean the water, right? They break down all that organic stuff in there and you, you know, there's settling and filtering and things like that, but we wouldn't be able to do this in, you know, the volume and the speed that we do it if it weren't for all these microbes. So it's kind of neat. There's, and there's different ways of processing sewage using microbes. Uh, but this is one example that they show you in the illustration here. So the rotating arm is spraying liquid waste and all those little guys living in that rock rock bed with water are just going to town on that. Here's a picture from the, the Deepwater Horizon spill. So they're spraying chemical dispersants to, you know, hoping that bacteria can help clean that up. <clears throat> so again, as I mentioned way back when, comparing prokaryotes, they have identified two major branches, bacteria and archaea. Used to be we said we'd use prokaryote and bacteria as the same term. But in the 80s, wasn't that long ago, um, this, this fellow Wos figured out that there's actually two major groups of prokaryotes. And so the second group he called the Archaea. So think of it as like, like ancient, right? So archaeology, people studying ancient things. So bacteria and the Archaea. So life is organized into three domains. Bacteria and Archaea, which are both prokaryotic, and eukarya, which are the eukaryotes. Now the, archa the archaea, what we want to do is go into that in a little bit more detail. The archaeans are kind of neat because a lot of these guys are the truly old. I, I, I usually think of archaea, archaea the, as old, and I think of these as the old school. These are things that developed a really long time ago, and they're still around today. And we find them in places where very little else can survive. And so they often use the term extremophiles, right? File means love. So, you know, a person who's a chocolophile loves chocolate. Well, extremophiles like extreme environments. So one group are thermophiles. They like it really hot. Literally water that is boiling temperature in many cases. Another group are the extreme halophiles. Halo refers to salt, like halide compounds. So the extreme halophiles are the salt lovers, and you find them in really salty environments. A third group are methanogens. Now, whenever you see ogen, O-G-E-N, it means generate or making. So methanogens make or give off methane. These guys live in anaerobic environments, like the gut of, of animals, and Again, they, if they, you, you expose them to oxygen, that kills them. It's actually, they have to live in a, in a low oxygen or oxygen-free environment. And one of the things that they generate in their metabolism is methane. So if, you, if someone consumes certain foods that are very yummy to some of these anaerobic organisms that live in your gut, they will often have a good time you know, chowing down on those nutrients, but unfortunately one of, the, one of the side effects is that they give off methane. So if you've ever seen uh, typically young men lighting farts, well, methane is very burnable. And so the, the gases that are given off are, and this is one of the reasons why cows are part of the, the whole business of climate change. All these animals with methanogens in their gut are burping and farting, if you will, methane into the air. And that's part of you know, one of the challenges we have. I know people say, oh, they're going to ban hamburgers. Forget that. But just understand that, yeah, there's a lot of methane in the atmosphere from digestion. And we have small amounts of methanogens in our own gut. That's why some of us eating certain food items will generate a little methane, um, just not in the giant volume that a cow would. Uh, also, we see it in the mud and the bombs of lakes. If you've ever had a chance to walk along a, the shore of a lake and you see bubbles of gas popping up out of the mud. These are, are things that live deep in the mud, so again, low oxygen or no oxygen, and they generate methane. And after a while, enough of that gas builds up that it pushes through the mud and bubbles up to the, to the outside world. It's sort of a fun thing. You, you might have heard people talking about UFOs and you'll hear someone say, oh, that's just swamp gas. 
Well, I said before, methane is very ignitable. And what happens is sometimes in swamps, there's methane bubbling up from the mud. If lightning were to strike and ignite that, you get this sort of uh, wild blue flame forming. And that's how some people would say, well, that wasn't UFO, that was swamp gas. What they meant was it was methane getting ignited in swamps. Now here's our halo files. I'm sorry, our, our thermophiles rather. So things like out in Yellowstone, there's these, these springs where you've got this boiling hot water coming up out deep in the ground. So again, it looks like, oh, it looks like a nice little hot tub. If you took a dip in there, you would not live for very long. So yes, it looks pretty, but keep in mind that that is really dangerously hot for eukaryotes like us. Now, in things like landfills, you've got bacteria breaking down all sorts of organics you know, deep in, in the piles of, of stuff. So what you're seeing here are pipes to collect the gas generated by methanogenic archaeans, because otherwise that methane could build up and ignite. And sometimes you might hear of a case of a landfill catching fire. And what's happening is it's not so much you're burning, <clears throat> excuse me, paper or stuff like that. It's all that methane from all those organisms. And you light that up and you could have a really major problem on your hands. So that's one way of dealing with it. Or others is to simply turn the material. So there's near me, there's a, a place where they, they make compost and, you know, compost. And part of what they have to do is they have to keep turning it over and over again to get oxygen in there to sort of suppress some of the, the development of those methane organisms so you don't have the potential for those fires. Okay, a couple more terms. Oh, bacteria that cause disease. Now, as I said, methanogens are things that generate or produce methane. A pathogen is something that generates or causes disease, right? Pathology is the study of, of things that make people ill. Well, bacteria and other organisms that cause disease are called pathogens. Most pathogenic bacteria cause disease by producing a poison. And this can come in one of two ways. Exotoxins, right, exo meaning out, are proteins that bacterial cells secrete outside of their cells into the environment. Endo means inside. Endotoxins are components of the actual outer membrane of the bacteria. Right? So there's toxins within the cell itself. So all endotoxins generate the same general symptoms, fever, aches, sometimes uh, something called septic shock, which is a really dangerous drop in blood pressure. So if you think in terms of, of living stuff, you could kill the cells and maybe cause breakdown of endotoxins, but if they've secreted exotoxins, yeah, the bacteria may be dead, but those poisons are still in the environment. That's why you have to be careful with things like spoiled food. Uh, here's another charmer that causes meningitis. So what, one of the best ways of preventing bacterial diseases is simply sanitation, right? Keeping environments, you know, from being places where bacteria can accumulate or, or, you know, or get exposed to things like our food supply or our water supply. So things like water treatment and sewage systems is an important thing because a lot of diseases, a lot of uh, microbes that, that cause disease can, you know, be shed from the body and fecal material and urine. So the fact that you have to clean this stuff up is actually a big priority across the world. We get kind of used to the fact that we treat water um, in many parts of the world, but there are other places where they don't have things like complex sewage systems. And they have to find small scale ways of doing this, sometimes without a lot of free water, the way we have it around here. So uh, I'll just sort of let it go there, but there's, it, it's interesting. There's all sorts of ways to try and treat, you know, things like sewage so that you don't have, you know, dangerous things and microbes in the environment as well as the waste products. Now, we found antibiotics that work against most bacterial diseases, but as you know, as I've mentioned before, resistance is evolving in many of these pathogens because it's, again, good old natural selection, variations in a population of pathogens. If somebody can survive, then that guy's going to leave more little baby, you know, organisms. And those will increase in numbers, so the ones that can get killed by the um, antibiotic don't. So 
we were always having to work out ways of using antibiotics to try and keep switching it up so that we can counteract that problem. And another defense against bacterial disease is just education. Uh, something like Lyme disease, which is named after Lyme, Connecticut, it's caused by a spirochete bacterium that's carried by ticks. Uh, there's this, often people talk about the bullseye rash, uh, you know, characteristic back rash, but keep in mind that not all of these tick bites generate that bullseye rash, or it might be in a spot where you don't see it. So uh, don't rely just on that uh, as a determination as whether you've been bitten by one of these ticks. Let me get to the smaller pictures here. That is the tick that carries Lyme disease. It's not the dog tick that you might have seen, the big gray tick you might have seen on a dog or a cat. Uh, this is a different kind. This is a, uh, a, a small little guy. And if you look carefully, and again, a lot of people probably don't think about the details of ticks, but it has very long feeding parts, right? You've got those eight little legs, and then right at the front, you see, it looks almost like a, like a little watermelon seed. At the very front, you see what looks like a little a little probe. Let's look at this guy closer there. So those long mouth parts are really good distinguishing features. So one, they're much smaller than dog ticks. Two, they have those long mouth parts. And so that helps you identify these guys. And again, these are, you know, they're relatively small ticks. So almost like a sesame seed sort of size. And inside this guy's gut are these. And this is the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. Now, the potential for some pathogens to cause harm has caused, you know, we humans are always great with finding new ways to hurt each other. Some are used as biological weapons. And one that you've heard of relatively recently is the use of anthrax. Um, it's These are endospores, right? So these are the little things that can survive extremes of environment. They're, they're tough little things that they just... Are, Almost, think of them almost like a seed, right? It's a bacterium with this protective coat that can hang out until it finds itself in good conditions. Well, to weaponize some bacteria, they do is they collect endospores. And those endospores can be, you know, distributed in a powder. Or, you know, white, you always hear, you know, white powder in an envelope, right? That, that's just one way in which they can distribute endospores of these bacteria. The bacteria get ingested or, or you know, by breathing typically into the lungs, they germinate and they start multiplying because the lungs are a very cozy place for a lot of these guys to live. And as they multiply, they produce an exotoxin, right? They secrete this exotoxin that builds up to dangerous levels in the blood. Another one uh, that has been thought of as, as potentially for an, uh, a weapon use is Clostridium botulinum. Now, unlike other bot biological agents, the weapon form of botulinum is the exotoxin it produces, botulinum. So it's not the microbes that people use, they just collect the toxin. So anthrax, you're spreading the organisms here, you're, you're basically collecting the exotoxin, not, you know, relying on, on the, the organisms themselves. So as we study the, the microbiota in, in humans, you know, we are curious what their interactions are with their, with their own bodies. And a lot of the bacteria basically are neutral to our bodies, right? So it's a type of symbiosis where they, they have a place to live, but it doesn't have any effect on you, good or bad. Some are beneficial, right? So they do improve our health, like generating my, uh, vitamins and things like that. Well, because our intestinal microbes are known to be involved with some types of elements of food processing, some researchers have wondered is, are these guys involved with obesity at all? So, okay, time to start cranking up the hypotheses, right? There are, people are developing hypotheses about how microbes may influence, you know, human metabolism. So often you do is you test these hypotheses in animal models, right? Before you get to humans, you test them on, on mammals. And they've actually generated strains of mice that are raised in germ-free conditions, raised in sterile environments. They have no microbiota. So if you want to see what happens when the, the microbes aren't there, instead of trying to find a bunch of people and sterilizing their guts, well, you start with these mice, which have been raised you know, in these environments that are you know, keeping them free of microbiota. Obviously, you have to keep them safe because they'd be you know, easily infected by something. Anyway. 
onward. Um, so re researchers recruited four pairs of human female twins. People, twins are kind of great for some forms of research because it's a way of having individuals with the same genes, right? If you're studying plants, you could clone plants and have hundreds of copies of, from one individual, you know, from little cuttings and stuff. Uh, humans, we don't really do that. So often people, you know, researchers will do research involving twins because you know that these people have the same basic genome. Well, they recruited four pairs of, of human female twins to donate their microbiota for the experiment. And the neat thing is in each of these pairs, one was obese and the other was lean. So, okay, these people have the same genome. So what's the difference between these two? It's not something in their genes because they got the same genes. So here's a case where they're like, well, oh, maybe this is the, the organisms in them. So they extracted microbes from the feces of each individual, which sounds horrible, it's, it's not. It would basically make a solution, you filter it. But they extract the microbes from the, the feces of each individual, culture them, right? So you, you're not literally transporting feces from person to person. They extract the microbes, they grow the microbes, say on agar or the materials, and then they take those, those populations of microbes and then transplant them. Um, in this case, into separate groups of lean, germ-free mice. So you want to see, it is something, you know, these mice are, again, genetically pretty much the same. So, okay, the only thing being different is whether they have those microbes or they don't. So mice that got the microbiota from an obese donor became more obese. The mice that got microbiota from a lean donor remained lean. Now, do we have a microbe-based cure for obesity, you know, right down the street? No. Uh, this experiment and many similar ones, they're just different points of scientific investigation. So it isn't that one bit of research suddenly, boom, you have a cure for something. But it's like you're finding parts of a puzzle. And so all these points of research, you compile all this information and collectively you might be able to find something as a treatment for obesity. So keep in mind that this is sort of early in investigation, but the fact that we do see in some mammals that microbes can be involved with obesity, that's kind of a cool thing. So again, a lot more research yet to come. This is all pretty early stages, but it's kind of a fascinating thing to look at. It's like, will we eventually get to the point of prescribing microbes to help sort out various problems? So again, starting out with this case, we had mice with no microbiota. We took twin donors, right? And they transplanted these microbiota. So we know the only microbes in their guts were from these donors. And then they watched what happened. And, and all lean donors, their fat composition remained very low, right? If you look on the left-hand side, right by the zero, right? You see, you know, that little mark there, right? So really no change in body composition. They started lean, they stayed lean. But if you look to the right-hand side, you see that from the, you know, the mice that had obese donors that the fat mass increased a lot as well as the lean body mass. So these guys put on weight and much of that weight is fat. So, so you know, this would be you know, developing obesity. So it's kind of neat. This is again, one new area of research that's just developing in recent years. And I just put in this slide referring to the protists. So again, I'm going to talk about the protists when we get to later on in the semester. So when we go into the various eukaryotic classification groups, I'm going to throw the, the protists in there. Um, so the one thing I do want you to, to, I do want to point out to you is that it's not a real classification group. Most living things are an ancestor and all the descendants, but all protists don't have one ancestor. And so it's kind of, a, I call it the trash can. If it doesn't fit into fungi, and it does, I mean, these are eukaryotes. So if it's a eukaryote that is not a fungus, not a plant or not an animal, we just throw them all in the pile we call protista. So for us in the, you know, in this current time, they're just, you know, a trash can classification. Probably in another generation or two of humanity, they might break it down into more kingdoms, but fortunately for you, we just keep them in one spot. Okay, last part is the evolution connection at the end of the chapter. Uh, 
The Sweet Life of Streptococcus, Streptococcus mutans. A biofilm for, forming species of bacteria called Streptococcus mutans lives in the anaerobic environment found in little tiny crevices in tooth enamel. Now these guys love table sugar. So they use sucrose to make a sticky polysaccharide, right? They, they basically compile these, these polysaccharides, use that to glue themselves into these little tiny crevices in the tooth enamel. And as they grow, as they consume food, they build up these thick deposits of plaque made of the sick, sticky polysaccharide filled with these bacteria. Within that protective material, these guys ferment sugar. They carry out metabolism without oxygen. So they ferment sugar to obtain energy. A byproduct of that type of fermentation, we're going to get into this after, after the exam, is lactic acid. That acid is what breaks down tooth enamel. And it will eventually, you know, degrade right through to the to the soft parts, like the dentin or, or heaven forbid, even the nerves. So as it makes makes these holes, etches these holes with the acids, other bacteria can then use this as a way of getting into the tooth, and you wind up with this sort of scenario. Well, studies of prehistoric human remains have correlated dental disease with changes in diet. Recent research links S. mutans directly to these rises in tooth decay. And one of the weird things about it is that what used to be a very diverse oral microbiota became much less so about 400 years ago, which is about the time that humans developed sugar and you know, incorporated that into their diet. And what happened was we went from a really diverse oral microbiota, like a really you know, diverse ecosystem, down to basically it being a one species ecosystem, and that would be S. mutans. So what happened? Well, researchers studying these guys realized that more than a dozen genes that improved the ability of Streptococcus mutans to metabolize sugar and survive increased the acidity and basically served as chemical weapons that killed the other bacteria. So basically killing the competition to live inside the, you know, the human oral cavity. So one way in which people are, are trying to improve their dental health is to reduce the amount of sugar in their diet, not just for you know, the fact that it, it um, you know, excess calories and all that, but it enables the other regular bacteria of the mouth to be able to repopulate again. So you don't have a largely plaque forming, cavity forming population is you get a more diverse population. So you make things a little bit harder for the for Streptococcus mucans and the rest of the guys can start living there again. And that's the end of the chapter.